All right, so the next session is, what models do we need to improve risk management in the 21st century? And it's packed full of experts, many of whom I, whom I know. So we're about to get some key insights and advice for, and tips from C-level experts who are leaders of this quantitative movement. So remember, uh, as they, as they uh, present, have your questions ready, uh, scan that QR code. So this panel is going to be moderated by my good friend, uh, Robert Rodriguez, who's the chairman and founder of Cynet. Um, please help me welcome our esteemed panelists. Good morning. Robert Rodriguez, chairman of Cynet, venture partner at Sin Ventures. Honored to be here. I want to thank Jack for what you're leading here at the Fair Institute. I think it's incredibly important to Socket and Nick for what you're doing at SAFE. When I think about the word risk, every single day we take risk, whether it's jaywalking, whether it's running the yellow light, wh whatever it is. Um, but, it's, but I call it managed risk, right? So we're not going to really do something that harms us for the most part. And when I think about the CISO of today, and I call them risk executives, and I call them risk executives because if you think about the amount of responsibilities that they have, they manage more risk than most people in a corporation. But then they have a tremendous amount of liability. So last night, Joe Selvin was at this, this dinner. I'm sure you know who he is. Uh, uh, I interviewed Tim Brown a week ago, the CISO at SolarWinds a million dollars of legal debt. Thank goodness, Sock Sue Hawker, the CEO of the board, approved paying for that. He had to go to the hospital three weeks ago because of the stress. Um, he said, Robert, this is killing me. So just a lot, lot of stress, a lot of risk to manage. And today we're going to have our subject matter experts, our esteemed panelists, cover this. But lastly, I just want to say that the evolution of the 21st century CISO continues today. And if you think back 10 to 12 years ago, a lot of times they're seen as a cost center, blue collar security person, maybe reports to the CIO, very rarely reports to the board, and didn't have a seat at the table. But today, many of them are briefing the boards quarterly, if not more, sometimes have a seat at the table, and, and desire to be seen as enablers and drivers of business enterprise-wide, and want to be seen as risk executives and respected at the same level. So with that, let's go down the line, Kurt, and introduce yourself. Kurt John, Chief Security Officer for Expedia Group, uh, responsible for privacy, physical security, cybersecurity, and business continuity. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Nathaniel Davis. I'm from Rolls-Royce of North America. Um, that's jet engines, not cars, so no <laughs> discounts for anyone. <laughs> uh, head of security for all of our physical facilities here in North America, as well as numerous ones in the UK. Um, that's personal security, physical, um, insider threat, business continuity, and numerous other things. Thank you for having me. And, and that was the first question we asked uh, Nate, is uh, what side of the Rolls-Royce he came from and if he brought any samples. And did not, unfortunately. Um, I'm uh, Paul Selby. I'm the Chief Information Security Officer for the Department of Energy. Uh, and um, I've accomplished one goal for today. Um, they always say, don't be the smartest person in the room. Covered. Got that. Um, so when, uh, when Robert talks about experts, um, we will certainly do our, I will certainly do my best. The only thing I'm a true expert in is uh, 80s hair metal. So if anybody's got any questions about 80s hair metal, I'm your guy. Glad to be here. I'm Jen Buckner. I'm with MasterCard Risk, uh, overseeing technology risk management inclusive of security and resilience risk. I'm uh, Ian Rathy. I'm the uh, global CISO for the uh, Fitch Group, which includes Fitch Ratings and uh, a number of other bu businesses. And I'm responsible for, uh, for cyber risk uh, globally. Well, Paul, I'm going to start with you because we have a lot of synergy in common where what you described to me is the Ronald Reagan management style, where you surround yourself with people smarter than you, you put your ego in the pocket, and, and we all rise. So I, I love that, I love that approach. So how has risk and risk management changed for today's society in your role? Yeah, no, and, and that's a great way to get this conversation started. Um, um, so, and I loved your analogy too about what, you know, the, the CISO role changing from a blue collar role 
to more uh, of an executive and, and um, leadership role where you have to have a much more holistic view into what risk is. Um, it kind of reminds me of, of the 80s, right, when, in, in, when purchasing, you know, was everybody's, you know, cousin or brother you put in that job, and then, it, you know, um, Chrysler and Lee Iacocca kind of modernized the whole just-in-time thing, and purchasing became a corporate synergy rather than just something you put your cousin in. And I think um, cybersecurity has become that way. And, you know, 10, 15 years ago, it was an afterthought, and, you know, um, it was just a, a subset of, this, of the IT functionality. Now, CISOs... Um, rightfully um, are more involved in the day-to-day, -day, um, you know, in the, the leadership of the company or the organization. Um, and when you look at everything that's going on, both geopolitically and technology, um, it, it's, in, it's the appropriate level, because it's, to your point, it's not, it's not about eliminating the risk, but how do we manage the risk, and how do we appropriately signify what the risks are? I mean, when you look at, um, you know, some of the regulatory changes, some of the uh, technological changes. I mean, artificial. We were talking previous, uh, briefly about artificial intelligence and the risk that that that, that puts in from the deep fakes and the you know the phishing uh, capabilities that that brings in. So um, you know the the risk is viewed today and, and the way we manage risk today has changed drastically just because of the potential um, impact that you know the, a, a cyber breach brings to us. It's frightening. I I, I feel for the risk executives today and. And Ian, you've been in this business for a long time. What changes have you seen and what's working today, what's not? So um, when I think about this, I, I just think about, you know, sort of the changes over the last 10, 15 years with the uh, very shortened news cycles and, you know, having to get out ahead of narratives. You know, if something does happen um, that, that uh, you know, it, it, you have an incident at, at your company, you have to get out ahead of those news cycles uh, if you want to be able to control the narrative. And so, you know, your planning and such goes a lot deeper than I, I believe that it used to go, you know, when I first started in this in industry sort of 25 years ago. Um, it was sort of something that you planned off to the side, and now it's more and more integrated into the into business strategies and things like that. And Jennifer, thank you for your service to to the country. You served in the military. What what lessons did you learn in the military with managing and mitigating risk that you've taken into industry? I think all of us would appreciate um, the. Uh, trying to demonstrate the value of preventing something that never, if it didn't happen, how can you demonstrate that that's a that's value add? But of course, that's the premise. So I liken it to some of, you know, our, um, in the intelligence community, our counterterrorism work, that the whole job was to prevent it from happening in the first place, and that's the value proposition. But what I also take is um, military, government, um, discipline in exercising, uh, and exercising with the people who make decisions, who are on the front lines, who are in the boardroom. Um, and I think, uh, you know, really currently is that that's not just an internal exercise now, that has to be with our critical suppliers, as those are, you know, perhaps introduced single points of failure, um, as well as our customers, so that when we are called to react, we have relationships, we have practiced, and we can certainly adapt to the specific situation, but that premise that we would exercise what we are expected to do in crisis is certainly a common theme from the military and government into industry. Kurt. Yeah, so I do have a, a couple of points on the earlier question and how risk has changed. I think there's a non-trivial correlation between sort of, and I promise I'm not trying to use these big words on purpose, the democratization of technology throughout the business and the evolution of the CISO role or the security role when it comes to in, uh, interacting with executives. So, you know, if a, a breach were to happen, the blast radius is huge, more of the business gets taken down, so all of a sudden executives are like, well, wait a second. Help me understand what my risk is here. So as, as we've had that explosion of technology, including AI and whatever else, like spread throughout the business, that's when the boards, rightfully so, are paying more attention. Um, on the question of, you know, Jennifer, you made a really good point. One of the things that we're toying with when it comes to, you can't prove you stop something from happening, but we're trying to take two lenses. A is we try our best to demonstrate 
how we might be doing that. But the second is, I'm talking to my board about how do you introduce more friction for the attacker between the point of entry and whatever the golden nugget is. So think of it as, you know, I've demonstrated it as a funnel. And then the point of entry might be multiple places, I don't know, help desk, wherever it is. And then do I have cloud security posture management? Do I have data protection? Do I have network security? Do I have encryption around my data? If, for, God forbid, that data is compromised, how quickly can I do a cyber restore? So that is one thing that I'm finding very valuable is demonstrating the amount of friction you're introducing between the attacker and your golden nuggets, and then how quickly can you recover? So that friction piece and the amount of risk has really evolved since 2019. So if we think about 2019, entering 2020, uh, work from home, all of a sudden, overnight. I mean, the tech companies were, had a five-year plan how they were going to achieve it. Manufacturing, finance, bank, everybody innovated and made it happen. And then you had to worry about the, the physical health of your employees and colleagues. And then it went on and on, and then you had the mental health challenges, because it went on. And then we break out of it, and then it's a hybrid model. So now you got to adjust to that. And then there's the geopolitical impacts of Russia, Ukraine, and now just recent, Israel and, and Gaza. So people, supply chain. Nate, how is your corporation dealing with this? Well, that's a very good question. Um, I think, as we were, we were discussing earlier, we've been hit over the past five to six years with more calamity and just life-changing incidents than we probably have in a very long time. And again, Russia and Ukraine, COVID, that was a huge one. Um, it's forcing us all to really think, well, one, the things that we figure would never happen, that you have to now entertain that. Um, as an example with Russia and Ukraine, um, as I was discussing outside, um, we are an aircraft engine manufacturer. Um, as you can probably imagine, very specific materials go into that process. Um, along with those specific materials, those things only come from certain places in the world. Um, when that happens, if you have a conflict somewhere, and as luck would have it, Russia is a place, um, they do make very specific things that are key manufacturing ingredients for some of the things that we do. Well, you know, one day you can, we're not best friends, but we could still purchase from them. Now, all of a sudden, there are sanctions against them, and you simply cannot purchase from them anymore. So these are things that now you have to consider, well, does the business come to a stop now? What are we going to do to circumvent that? Do we have to find other suppliers or backup suppliers? Did we bother to stockpile so that we can maintain um, our posture as far as moving forward? Or again, are we just forced to stop? These are all things I think, as Jennifer just pointed out, tabletops, um, it's, it's, it's really important to think about those things that, hey, we figure would never happen, to kind of entertain those things now. When I construct my uh, tabletop exercises with our teams, um, that's what I want to do. I want to make them feel uncomfortable. It is not an aha moment, you know, to say, we got you. But at the same time, to force them to think that, okay, they did hit us with a few instances where we weren't 100% sure how or what we would do and what the effects would be if we went down that path. But it encourages that thought process to begin to plan and think about those things that maybe just a year ago we just simply didn't consider. And yes. can I add to that really quickly? I think it's also forcing businesses to pay attention to things they historically didn't uh, culture, awareness, training, because a lot, a lot of the stuff that happened in the past five years, not even our wildest dreams would we imagine would happen. And so we've spent a lot of time trying to build that culture of resiliency, uh, adaptiveness, flexibility, and it's reflected in some decisions we make specifically about the business. So for example, we might say, hey, you know what? Pretty uncertain geopolitical times, how about we um, uh, do 40% of contingent staff and 60% like FTEs, right? And, and I'm not saying Expedia did that, but that might be a thought process. While also, to your point, while we're doubling down on mental health and so on, because at the end of the day, if you think about it, yes, it's a business, but it's made up of humans. And so the, the question is, how can we make the humans as resilient as possible, thereby making our business operations as resilient as possible? And Paul, I want to take the same question I asked Nate about the impact of geopolitical matters on your supply chain and, and your people, but mainly probably your supply chain. But I, I do want to comment that um, 
if you're in pharma and you have outsourced into China or you're uh, in the chip industry and a lot of it's coming from Taiwan, there's certain, con certain companies right now that are moving out of China into Malaysia and Vietnam because of the risk. Because we've, we've moved from a global economy and global relationships to nationalism and populism, and I can just continue to see that divide. How does that impact your thinking and your board's thinking? Uh, yeah, so no, I, I, let me just, uh, when you were talking about Ukraine, I will answer your question, but uh, when we talk about risk, I uh, met with a, a delegation uh, with Ukraine, from Ukraine, uh, about a year ago. Uh, and I was asked to come in and, and talk about cybersecurity. So I'm thinking, okay, great. I'm going to come talk to these Ukrainian folks about, you know, cyber hygiene and best practices and, you know, talk to them about multi-factor authentication and encryption and just all the things they should be doing. And um, in typical fashion, I went on and on and on, and they just listened politely and nodded their head. And then after I was done giving them all the best practices for, uh, for cyber, they said, oh, well, we're more concerned with it not getting blown up every night. And I'm like, wow, that puts things into perspective. Their problem was that the Russians kept blowing up their networks, so they'd have to move them every night. And, well, that's, that's a different issue. I guess cyber hide doesn't really matter if you have multi-factor multi authentication if people are blowing it up. But um, so the, the, the supply chain risk management, so there's two aspects of that from, from my view, right? There's the, the part that Nate's company is probably most concerned with is how do they get parts, right? I mean, because everybody, there was a, you know, in, during COVID, there was a shortage on everything. I tried to get the flooring in my house redone during COVID. God, that was a nightmare because the, the wood had to come from Canada and apparently that was affected by COVID. I don't know how trees get COVID, but I couldn't get, so, so everything was affected by the supply chain. Um, so there, there's that issue of it, but then there's the cyber part of it, right? I mean, how do we make sure, uh, and what do we need to do to make sure that there's no, uh, that what we get is not gray market material, uh, that there's no back doors built into it. There's no overarching uh, um, regulatory body that's doing IV and B, right? I mean, that's, that says, okay, the source code was built where it said it was, that we've done, uh, you know, the, the hashing of it to make sure that there was no changes from when it was written to when we got it. Um, you know, how are we doing that? So those are the kind of things that I think that we really need to take a look at, not just the country of origin and where is the code being written, because, you know, there, we all know that there's way, ways to get it to look like it's made in America, right? I mean, substantial transformation, what does that really mean? And everybody kind of can, can skirt around that and say, oh, it's substan we substantially transformed it. We assembled it in uh, you know, uh, a, a country that's not uh, subject to those regulations. But does that really get us to where we need? Uh, I, I don't think it does. I think we need to do more. I think we need to, as a, as, a, as, a, um, as a nation, as an industry, we need to figure out um, how we can best manage the supply chain to make sure that what software is written doesn't have back doors, doesn't have malware introduced in, you know, in, in, into it when we get it into our doors, right? Because that's, that's a whole other level of problems. So I think that that's something that, that we really could do better on uh, and we probably haven't focused a lot on. We, we look at the country of origin, okay, it's not manufactured there. Well, where was the software written? Who, who was doing the coding? But there was the very famous case, and I'm sorry for droning on about this, but there was the very famous case of a, uh, a contractor in Arizona who it was ingenious. Uh, he, was, um, he actually was holding down two jobs at a time um, because he had sent his, his RSA token to China and had outsourced his, his coding job to China. Um, so he, would, he gave him his RSA code. He would let the guy in China code every night. All the code was been written in China. He was getting the top marks in his company. He was like, this is great code. This guy's a genius. Um, meanwhile, he was working for somebody else, right? Um, so, you know, how do, we, how do we prevent those kind of things from happening? We need to take that, that piece in the supply chain risk management, the C in the supply chain risk management, the cybersecurity chain risk management, uh, a step further, in was my that, opinion. Was that during COVID? No, that was pre-COVID, actually. Oh, wow. Yeah, that was... That was uh, innovative. Can I add to that? Yeah. Because uh, I, I feel like the, all of us have in our, you know, current plate, overflowing plate, the management of critical suppliers in that whole end-to-end um, -end piece. Uh, but I also think increasingly in our interconnected world, as you highlighted, that we also have to consider, put that lens back on ourselves and manage ourselves as critical suppliers to other industry counterparts. And that proactive demonstration of can I evidence consistent with the expectations of the services or products that I provide from that country or point of origin all the way 
and, and through a life cycle, I think is also an, an expectation now of um, security, infrastructure, resilience pieces. Um, and, I, and, and I think it's causing all of us to kind of, we all want to move left of boom. So how can you design that proactive um, attestation in from the beginning, just like we've all evolved from, we don't add security on you know, at the end. We also build in that, um, that proactive understanding of suppliers and, and are there key considerations to what we will not outsource, um, which is I think a, a pretty important upfront business decision um, to inform that. And I think that affects national security and ultimately economic security. And so a lot of complexity in your job, uh, and it's so important to be able to articulate metrics or risk to support budget or what you need to do your job. How do you prepare for your board? What do you see works better along your colleagues and you and your, and your board? Um, I, I think with boards, it's about, you know, sort of scenarios and stories and, you know, tell, you, you need to sort of construct your, your narrative in a way that resonates with them. And a lot of that has to do with, you know, sort of putting in a scenario out there, sort of pointing out at a high level where the gaps are and, um, and you know, sort of driving a discussion around you know things that resonate with the board so a lot of times that's uh, um, like what's this going to cost us right and so that's a lot of, and you know frankly that's an area that in, in in my firm we've struggled with a little bit like how do we sort of paint these pictures in a way that sort of gets the attention of the right people in senior management and the board and sort of drives support for our programs right and that um, you know, that's something that evolves as you build your program out and it gets to be, you know, a, a, you know, you cover all of the basic things and then you start moving out into the harder things. You have to get better and better at having those types of discussions and, you know, a lot of it involves being able to measure and predict economic outcomes that, um, you know, it can, be, it can be difficult to do. Like, what's the opportunity cost of not doing something? What's the opportunity cost of responding to an incident, like reacting to it rather than being proactive, right? And, and uh, you know, one of the examples that uh, actually somebody talked to me about last night was um, the target breach, which believe it or not was, was 10 years ago now, um, one of the things that, one of the costs for them was that their, you know, sort of cleaning up that issue um, delayed their expansion into Canada. So what was the impact there on the bottom line and what was the ultimate impact to the shareholders? Um, you know, and that's something that, you know, risk models don't always cover. Hey, Kurt, same question. Yeah, it's a really good question. So boards typically ask two questions. Um, how at risk are we? Because they don't typically know to ask more specific questions. And then the second question is, how do we compare to our peers? And so how I typically do it is three, I give them three things. A is, here are the fundamentals that the industry recommends that we do and where we're lacking. The second is, okay, very specific to the business objectives. Our big bet for the next 24 months is product A. Product A relies on this technology to be successful, and if we fail at that, the entire launch is gonna be a dud. And therefore, we're trying to spend some money in this space to secure this particular thing. Um, and then the third typically is, in cases where similar companies of the size and scale of we are have experienced a breach similar to uh, around this product A that we're launching, um, here's what the impact's been, $100 million, $20 million, whatever the case might be. And very quickly, you can take out the first one for a bit, the fundamentals, you'll probably come back every year to the board and ask them for money for that. But very quickly, the board can make a very quick decision. Why? Because the upside of product A is $300 million. Uh, similar breaches have cost companies $150 million. I'm asking for 10. And so very quickly, it, it gives them what they need to make a decision. Can I, can I just Please. comment on that too? Because I, I, when we talked about the changing role of the CISO, I think this is probably the, the area where it's changed most, right? Where um, as CISOs, we're, we're no longer just the tech guys in the background or the tech gals in the background. 
um, that you know talk bits and bytes and feeds and speeds. Um, because if we come into the boardroom talking like that and don't talk in the language that you're talking about, Kurt, uh, you see the eyes roll in the back of the head and they don't understand, right? When we go in and we start talking about maturity models and, and uh, you know, compliance checklists and, you know, adherence to this, this policy and this regulation, they don't really get it. And, and I think this is where organizations like FAIR really help push us forward, right? Because we, we start talking about a common language and we start being able to put, um, you know, uh, the, the quantitative analysis behind this and say, hey, look, if you don't do this, this is the risk, exactly what you just said. Hey, if, if you don't spend this $10 million, it could cost you $200 million in this, or I think the, the final cost to target was over a billion dollars, right, or close to a billion dollars in when you t look at the operational cost, the opportunity cost, the reputational cost. So allowing us to put those, have those kind of conversations is, is changes the landscape. It changes the game for us uh, because Frankly, when I go in and talk about a maturity model and say, hey, you know, we're, we're at this level in the maturity model, that, that doesn't mean anything. I mean, okay, well, you know, great, thanks, and then you come back next quarter and now we're up at the next level. But when we start talking about it and putting language that you just talked about, Kurt, that's the game changer. And I think that that's how the role of CISO has changed, is you have to be able to navigate from one world to the other. You have to be able to live in the technical world, but if you cannot communicate what the real risks are, and I think what, what the FAIR Institute is doing is allowing us to put that in a language that's common and a taxonomy that's common across the board. I want to add to that. So I walked in today, and I'm, and I'm thinking about the FAIR Institute, and I'm thinking that next year we won't be here. There will be double the amount of people at the next one. And why? To your point. We need some type of standard, some type of expectation that is fundamentally foundational to continue to grow and build on. And if you think about cyber, it's very embryotic. It's 1966 was the first transmission from UCLA to SRI International. It was the ARPANET, I think. Um, and here we are today, what, Talking 50 years Jenny later, <laughs> and we're still you know, trying to figure it out, try to measure it, try to understand it. And Nate, how often do you uh, reevaluate your, your risk, your challenges with your team and, and company? That's a, that's a good question. Um, I've, I've been thinking about that. The funny thing is I was prior uh, Secret Service much like you, uh, Robert, and um, because we operated on a no failure principle, it's like, look, one, a bad day for us was a bad day for everyone. It didn't mean that we lost money. That meant that people were probably going to die. This would be something that would be on the news around the world. So for that reason, we continuously reevaluated our risk. I've kind of carried that over to the, the company with uh, Rolls Royce that I'm at right now, that we kind of do the same thing. You're going to have those, um, what I would call, systematic risks. There's just certain things that you just know we're going to have to watch and maintain. You know, you have your individual risk appetites for, as uh, the British say, that um, you're just going to always monitor, you know, making sure that your system is uh, patched as it should be. Uh, the multi-factor authentication and things like that, just certain things that there are certain risks that are just going to come with those no matter what. But again, as I was kind of uh, leading into um, earlier, the, the world is changing so much. Technology is changing so much. Um, and again, going back to my government days, um, as a law enforcement officer, I was, we knew we were always two steps behind the bad guy. You were always playing catch up because, I mean, they're working every day to outsmart you. Well, the same thing with risks. No risk, in my opinion, it just, the, the environment simply does not stay the same. I mean, what we were looking at last week, I mean, again, everything that's going on in the world, it's completely different from what we're looking at today. So for me, I look at those things, and that's one of those things I can consistently drill home to my, to my team, because I know things will slip past me. These are things, be it monthly or quarterly, that we need to discuss what's going on in the world. What types of things should we consider now that we weren't considering a month ago? And I think that's going to be the only way that you're going to try to keep up with risk. Again, I personally don't feel you'll ever completely mitigate it or, or just eliminate it because we're in the business of doing, you know, manufacturing. We have IT systems because as long as you have that and you're operating, unless you close yourself off in a steel box, don't interact with anyone, interaction with the world, there's going to be risk. But what we do is consistently look at it. Okay, how has the world changed? What is, what's going on out there now? What do we need to do to change and pivot so that we can identify those risks 
and again, mitigate them because I don't personally feel we'll ever eliminate them. But what steps can we take to mitigate them to where they're within our risk appetite so that we can feel, okay, we can comfortably operate to move forward. And again, it's a repetitive, you know, wash, rinse, repeat. We do it over and over and over again because again, things change. Nothing ever stays the same. Let's segue yeah. to Jennifer. Merging risks, uh, what do you see today and going forward? I mean, ransomware has been one of the big ones, but with Gen AI or uh, machine learning or narrow AI, which is a word I just learned today from Paul, what do you see happening? I think thematically, as uh, Nick introduced, um, we're covering all those bases here with Gen AI, our third party, third and fourth party. Um, and I think it's interesting because we can see the um, both sides of that. They are absolutely risks which have to be managed, but they're also business and value drivers. So not tending to look at risk as the roadblock or you know, an impediment, but being proactive to be responsible about that and put it in the business and opportunity terms because I think the risks of not um, leaning forward in those areas is, um, is greater than you know, the, 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 the alternative. Um, so I, I feel like that those drivers of, it's just, it can, it, we can all get, stop, oh wait, there's, it's so overwhelming but it can be managed, and in fact, it must be in order to be um, drive value for the business. So, and I, I just want to get over yeah. to Ian. And come, I, I have a question for you from the audience, Kurt. Okay. Same question to you. What do you see evolving over the next 12, 18 months? Threats, okay. attacks. Um, you know, I, I certainly like AI is something that we're thinking about, and, and to Jennifer's point, it's something that we're thinking about, but it's also something that we're, you know, working very hard to enable broadly at the company and make sure that people, you know, can start experimenting with it and, and taking advantage of it and looking at how we could use it in our, in, in, in our, um, you know, sort of business, um, business development and such. Um, I, you know, I see that being a big one. Um, I see, you know, and it's AI related. Um, deep fakes are something that we're more and more concerned about. You know, we already deal with the sort of WhatsApp CEO impersonation type things. And, uh, you know, we've been fairly successful with our awareness campaigns about that. But as these things get to be, you know, where the CEO can actually phone you up and it sounds like the CEO and, uh, uh, you know, how do we how do we sort of train people uh, to recognize those types of things? So those are areas that we're worried about. Um, we talked about it a little bit earlier. Um, saturation uh, in certain large suppliers that we all use, and what happens if they go away for some reason? Um, you know, those are all things that I think we uh, you know we're thinking about a lot more than we used to. Kurt, I want to go to the audience. So Tony. Roby, for you, Kurt, says, you mentioned adding friction for threat actors as a means of demonstrating value to the business. How do you balance that friction with a frictionless oh. experience for the business? I knew that's, that was the question Great was going to come. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, security is an inherently, and there are very few caveats, it's an inherently friction-based domain. We pat ourselves on the back and we derive value when we introduce friction. The question is, and what I like to tell and what I tell my board is, we are doing security with context. And so as long as I can continue to demonstrate that the introduction of this friction, when you weigh it against either slowing down or hampering the business with the impact of a particular risk being realized, and we all, so I'm not doing this in a vacuum, we all agree that's an acceptable level of friction, then we're okay and we continually reevaluate that on, a, on an ongoing basis. And it might be instances where I'm reducing friction in one place because we've gotten to a certain point of maturity or something else while introducing friction in others. So it's a very ebb and flow type situation. That's really quick, like 30 seconds. I wanted to comment on the question of risk. risk ebbs, flows, what started as an export control risk becomes a legal risk, becomes a compliance risk, becomes a technology risk, and it, they grow, they cover multiple domains, they shrink, they're over here, they're over there, and we can't begin to fathom 
the type of risk that we're going to face in the future, particularly with Gen AI. And so businesses need to focus on resilience. And that's one of the themes that I've been teasing out for my board is we are going to do everything we can left of boom. But the other thing that we're focusing on like maniacally is also resilience. Real quick. So when you talk about reducing friction, I, I can assume that a lot of it's DevSecOps, IT, security, that cultural change management mm -hmm. challenge, right? Yep. Enabling the business yes. and safely. Yes, exactly. So and again, that's why, so for, there are some things that we're trying to introduce right now, which does introduce friction, but again, and it's in the DevSecOps area. Uh, and it depends on the nature of your company as well. So we have like thousands of developers. Right, so I have to be very careful about how I'm introducing friction there. There are other companies where the friction is going to be a little bit different. And so just continue to have a conversation with um, your, your peers or senior management, whoever it may be, so that there's full awareness and agreement and alignment on the steps that you're taking to try to minimize um, the business risk. Thank you. So, so Paul, uh, we have a question for you from Ferris Perali. As a government agency, how you integrate cybersecurity best practices into the supply chain and acquisition for products and services acquired from other countries and how you can enforce these practices to reduce some of the cyber risk? You no, know, that, that's a great question. I was really hoping to get a question on 80s hair metal, but uh, I'll try to answer this one instead. Um, but, um, so for us, we're, we're a little bit fortunate in that we don't have a choice, right? So we have the federal acquisition regulations. Um, and, and I think you're seeing that, that that's where they're pushing all of these things. I mean, there, there, there's a recent uh, ban on uh, bite dance that's being pushed through the federal acquisition regulations. So, so for us, it's, it's a little bit simpler than it is for my colleagues on the stage who have to navigate the commercial world of it and don't get to rely on, hey, the federal acquisition regulations say you have to do this so we don't have a choice. So for us, uh, you're, you, and you will see those, there's, I think you'll see drafts coming out for comments. And, uh, for those of you in industry, when you see those comments come out or those drafts come out for comments, please provide your input. We need your input, right? So please provide input. That is the, the industry's input into what we do is vital to our success. The only thing I can tell you for sure from the U.S. government standpoint is we've got real problems and we can't solve them on our own. We need industry's help. We need, we need everybody to help, uh, to help solve some of these problems. Um, so when you see these uh, you know, uh, drafts come out for comments, provide your input. But th to answer your question, that's how, for us, it's we have a forcing function in the federal acquisition regulations. We are not allowed to do that. Um, so we have to ab abide by those things. Thank you. We have another question here. It's from Andre. It's not specific to anyone, so I open it to the floor. Aren't we reaching the customer's capacity to support more frictions in the business? How to balance customer's friction with including more friction to the attackers. Awareness is reaching completely its limit. So I just have to make a comment. So when I speak to 10 to 20 CISOs a week, and I, I ask a lot of questions, but some of the words that they really want are, for things they want are greater visibility. In fact, that's one of the number one probably, automation, remediation, operational resilience. But be careful what you wish for, because now you have data overload. Now I need contextualization to the data so I can prioritize and, and make actionable. Do you feel you're getting to a point of data overload and just too much? Anybody? Yeah, yeah. I, I, think that that's a, I think that that's a real risk. Um, you know, that, that um, people get burnt out on, on uh, if I'm understanding the, the point that the, the question is, is making, is it, do you get too burnt out on you know cyber 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 all the time and people get kind of numb to the conversation uh, and I, and I do think that 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 is a risk um, at one of the last land warnet concert conferences that they had before they broke it up into all the smaller conferences and I'm sure you probably remember that um, they they brought in, <laughs> the signaliers brought in a operator to be the guest speaker it was General Ham and he's an old tank guy if I remember correctly he's a tank guy I don't think he was interested I think he was a tank guy um, and um, Boy, he, he blasted him. He said, uh, he said, I'm tired of you making your problem my problem. Um, he said, you guys got to go figure out how to give me what I want and make it secure. Don't just tell me no, right? And I think that that's, you know, that, that's the fine line we always have to, to, to walk. And, um, 
you know, I think the, the pendulum has, has been over here, and I think all, all five of us, on, all six of us on stage would probably want the pendulum permanently over here, right? Because, you know, we, we know the consequences of it not. But, you know, the, the people conducting the mission or running the business have a different view on that. And how do we walk that fine line? I, I, don't, I don't have a crystal ball. I know that um, I will always push for the more secure. And, and Jen and I were having this conversation earlier um, about some of the government no-fail missions, right? I mean, there's things that we cannot just say we're going to accept this amount of risk. Now, and Jen was correct, we can't eliminate risk. There's no way I can guarantee things won't happen. But, you know, how do we, how do we keep it over there um, with some of our no-fail missions? Um, how do we um, evaluate and accept? And I think, I, I don't seem to sound like I'm plugging this all the time, but I think what the FAIR Institute is trying to push is giving us a methodology for doing that exact thing. How do, we, how do we not make it a qualitative thing? How do we make it a, a quantitative analysis and say this is the acceptable factor and to, to keep that friction at the appropriate level? I'll say really quickly, um, one of the reasons why Gen AI is going to be such a big deal, um, so I hesitate to answer the question because there is just so much data but that we don't even know how much data we have. And it's super hard to take data from multiple contexts and try to pull, pull them together and create a bigger context, right? Especially business context. So one of the reasons why Gen AI is gonna be so big across businesses is because it allows you to do that in a very economical way. Now the barrier to entry for your own Gen AI right now is still kinda of high, but it'll, it'll lower. And all of a sudden you can throw all the, the, the context you have within one model, and then it'll start teasing out, you know, this broader context. So the answer to the question is yes, we're struggling with that today. I expect it to change over the next 18 to 24, starting over from the next 18 to 24 months. But obviously that's now gonna bring some additional risks, <laughs> right? So you're solving some it's risks there, but then you're introducing <laughs> some other risks. So I think the attacks of the future are gonna be um, poisoning models, right? Because if you think about it, models will scale and you'll make these critical decisions based on data that the models are presenting to you. Uh, fact check to a certain degree, but all of a sudden the, the impact of an incorrect decision, whether it's hallucination, poisoning, whatever, I wouldn't be surprised if attackers are kind of like, I'm gonna break in, poison all your models, delete your backups, and if you don't pay me money, your business will grind to a halt. Right, much more efficient way than trying to ransomware all the things when you don't understand where they might be. So it's gonna be a very interesting um, next, I would say, three to five years. So as we wrap up, I have one question, rapid fire for all of you. If you were an entrepreneur or a venture capitalist, what would you invest in oh, or easy. build that's not available today? And if you can't think of something cyber, maybe it's a tool at the beach, I don't know, but mm. Kurt. Um, I would build AI that can measure the efficacy and sort of ethics authenticity of AI, because uh, only AI can, can measure AI. And so that'll help detect uh, deep fake voices and whether or not your model is operating the way it should and so on. I think there's going to be a lot of money in that, in that space. And by the way, that's a growing space, the control yeah. space with the co we just invested in a, a company called Cranium in that space. Yeah, 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 yeah I know Cranium. I'd have to agree. Um, I would think um, AI detection is what it's going to come down to because, again, there's so much out there. And as we said, it's getting better and better and better that, as we were just saying, where the CEO just called you on WhatsApp and you had a conversation with him and you really thought this was him. We're going to get to the point where you really cannot tell the difference. So as someone was saying earlier, when you're getting emails and, you know, before it's like, well, before you could see it was a spear phishing or something like that, pretty crappy email and you kind of knew it. But when things are getting so good now that, you know, for 99% of us, you can't detect it anymore from your own training. That's going to be an even more problem. So tools that can detect that kind of stuff, I think it's going to be huge. Yeah, yeah. I, and boy, this is going to, I, I, hopefully Jen has got something more brilliant than I've got on this because I'm going to say what they said. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and from two perspectives, right? I mean, so I think, I mean, we've all known phishing has been the number one attack vector for years, right? In the first half of 2023, it's now up to 92%. 92% of attacks start with some kind of email-based attack, right? So, I mean, that's, that's alarming. I mean, it's continuing to go up, and what AI can do with that is ridiculous because, I mean, you know, the, one of our great detectors was, you know, 
hey, they misspelled this, you know, and, and that's going to go away. But as I, I can tell you, the thing that even scares me even more is this deep fake stuff. And, and this case that, uh, you know, just horrifies me is the Di Stefano case from a couple years ago where the lady was at home uh, and she got a call and um, it was her daughter on the phone screaming that she's been kidnapped and they're hurting her. And it was just, as a parent, it was just heart-wrenching to listen to, except it was all fake. I mean, it was all deep fake. I mean, and I mean that's just horrifying. So, so I'm going to go with what what they said b because I agree with it, and also because I'm not smart enough on my feet to come so up. So, are we with going four unique. for four, Jan? What are we doing? I'll just put the exclamation point on it, and I would say productizing trust, because uh, there are a lot of siloed solutions around identity and privacy, but but that putting it all together for a um, a, tr a trust and a, an assurance picture is, I think, yeah. really um, where I'd put my money. Uh, so I was going to say the same thing as everybody else. It's decided <laughs> we are starting a company. You know, the other area that I think, uh, you know, it continues and it has for 20 years uh, cry, cry out to be solved is the vendor risk stuff. Like, like how can we do a better job with res re centralizing vendor risk assessments in a way that we don't all have to build a huge infrastructure for answering vendor risk assessments and also for doing vendor risk assessments. I'm, that's an area that really cries out for some innovation and has for the last 20 years. Well, thank you all for your time. Let's go raise some capital. Socket, get the... <laughs>